Yeah, there we are. Okay. Time to continue with part two. Uh, so Yami already asked you whether there are still questions about part one, right? No questions left? Or not yet there? Okay. So, uh, where are we starting? Yes. So now we're going back to problem folding that we've done before. Uh, so Yami showed you how free energy and probability uh, are related. Uh, and, and the example that I already showed very briefly with the, uh, the, the, um, the HP model with the, the simple configurations. Right? <coughs> so uh, for real proteins, and there's, there's many different ways to which people try to depict a uh, multi-dimensional free energy surface. None of them are any good, really. Uh, but th this is just another one, right? And, and so there's two dimensions trying to indicate different conformations. And then the third dimension is, uh, is uh, it could be either the, uh, the enthalpy or the free energy, depending on what kind of things you're, you're what you're interested in. And the whole idea I showed you, did I show you this one before? I don't remember. Because I usually have it at least twice. Yeah. <coughs> so uh, the, the one of the trade-offs that's important to, to understand, or at least to know that it's there, is the fact that the lowest energy, so this is energy now, not free energy. So this is enthalpic energy, interaction energy. But so the one that has the best energy isn't necessarily the most likely state because of the entropic cost of being only in this one specific conformation where maybe there's like five microstates or maybe 50 corresponding or um, and in contrast to the other state which is energetically much less favorable it's still favorable, but it's much less than this one. But there's just so many more uh, microstates, like maybe five million. Yeah? So that's really what the free energy is about. Yeah? So that's the entropic difference between these two states. Make sense? Yes. Yeah? Remember the dartboard? Yeah? This is the bullseye. Well, in a real dartboard there's no energy. Yeah, I don't know, sorry, I have to be precise here. In the real dartboard, there is no enthalpic energy. There's no interaction uh, with the, the, between the dart and the board. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's a small target, so it's just less likely to hit. It's not intrinsically harder to hit. That's the point. It's just less likely to hit a small target because it's so small. But it's always small relative to something else. Uh, if you have two different two states with the same small number of microstates, then, uh, then it, it is, again, just the enthalpic energy, the interaction energy between the two that will determine which, ones, which one is more stable than the other. <coughs> OK. So I'll show you a few. I'll, I'll dive a little bit deeper into the peptide example that I showed already before. And um, I will. I'm so happy that Yami did the first half of the lecture because you can hear from my voice. I, I managed uh, an hour and a half yesterday. That was about the limit. So, uh, <coughs> 45 minutes is, is much better. Um, uh, yes, so we'll do the peptide <coughs> again. Uh, dive a little bit more deeper into it because there's, there's a very nice follow up paper on it uh, that actually really shows this free energy landscape. Um, and then we'll go into the uh, the small protein, reversible small protein folding example that we have from the Shaw et al. paper, which was the reading material for today. Who read it? Okay. Ah, but that's that's good enough. <laughs> well, I'll have a I'll have a lecture on MD later on in the course. Um, and uh, yesterday I was discussing with Sonna that we might want to reoptimize the order of some of the lectures. 
we might not want to do that. But because it, if we do that, well, in terms of the ordering of the topics, it, it could be a little bit better. But then we are shifting uh, one of the paper reading, the other paper, uh, forgot which one it is. It will shift. Uh, it will shift forward. So you'll have to read that one earlier. Is, would that be like maybe I don't remember, like but two weeks earlier? Um, would that be a, a big problem for you guys? No. If if you, later on you think, oh crap, that's not going to work, just drop us an email because this gives me the green light to go back with Sana and see whether we do want to. Okay. <coughs> Um, so we'll go into so we'll, we'll do the short paper most of it now and we'll revisit it later <coughs> that's for sure okay um, and um, yeah so mm -hmm. uh, yeah we're there okay yeah, so you've seen this one before. It, it's the beta peptide with the extra. Uh, so the, the cool thing is, it actually has the C alpha in the backbone, like normal peptides, but then it has a C beta also in the backbone. Uh, and the side, oh, the side chain is actually on the C alpha. But then the, 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 the um, no, sorry. <coughs> it, the, the chemistry counting is always uh, surprising. So this is the C alpha, because that's where the, uh, the uh, oxygen, but the carbonyl comes from, and then this is C beta, and then the, the side chain is actually on the C beta. It's not so important. It's just, I'm just trying to show off my chemistry. <laughs> uh, so, um, and I also already showed you the uh, the. Um, I was somebody called me a chemist the other day. I was like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> if anything, I'm, I'm a biophysicist. But anyway. Um, so I already showed you this one, right? So the the, um, the simulation of one well, one of the simulations of this peptide, um, and um, the uh, the fact that you see really many 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 different conformations um, zipping by all the time, right? Uh, and this is what the experiment suggests. So this this was measured by uh, NMR in um, uh, by people in Zurich. I should actually look up. If I don't remember if they put the NMR stuff in the uh, together with the simulation paper, or I should actually put up a reference for the NMR paper if that ever was there. Uh, <coughs> anyway, uh, so this is the alpha helical shape that the uh, NMR data suggested, and then actually, if you if you look up these papers, they show that if you you calculate, you can from these from a conformation, you can calculate what the NMR spectra spectrum would would look like. Based on that confirmation, if you do this for the uh, for the proposed um, structure, it fits reasonably well. It doesn't really fit well for the side chains. If you do it over the whole uh, uh, ensemble of structures that you get from the simulation, it's an almost perfect fit, including all the side chains. Right. So this is quite uh, quite convincing. Uh, it's it, it is sort of a uh, dimensionality uh, fitting problem because you're increasing the number of parameters in your model. If the structure is your model, right, every atom coordinate is a parameter, or three actually, x, y, and z. But then if you go from a single structure to an ensemble of structures, then you have so many more parameters, and you can basically create any ensemble of this peptide to, to um, I'll say that to uh, produce any kind of spectrum that you would like. Okay, so it's always a, 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 a tricky balance to um, to go to ensemble um, structures there. Okay. Um, then we have the other one that we already did. Uh, should go to the next slide. Yeah. Yeah, uh, this one you already also showed, right? Uh, you also, also saw the uh, So here we are looking at the uh, RMSD, so the routine square deviation of the backbone with respect to the uh, to the to the folded structure, the, the helical one. 
we just calculate the backbone because we don't we're not interested in all the floppy things that the side chains do. It's, we want to just look at the overall structure here. The important thing here is that the when it's folded, it's folded, right? That means it's similar to the alphabetical NMR uh, structure. If it's if it's not folded, it's n the only thing you know that it's different. It's different from the alpha helical step, but it can be different in many many ways. It's like if you want if you're five kilometers if you're if you're five meters away from me, then you're most likely in this classroom, or you could be in the hallway or in the next classroom. But that's it, right? If you're five kilometers away from me, you can be in Amsterdam or in Dieben or in Haarlem or in almost in Kermelen. And, there many, and that's only in two dimensions. There are already many more options. You could even go up or down, although both are actually tricky. Yeah. <coughs> so um, as the distance increases, the number of different options to be at that distance increases rapidly. Right? Um, OK. So that's what you see here. And then uh, <coughs> there, there are really thousands of, of structures here. But if you cluster them, as I already mentioned last week, uh, you get about a thousand clusters that are really significantly different between uh, each other. I hear some discussion. Is that related to the to the uh, to the lecture contents, or is that it's okay? It's fine. Uh, <coughs> but if it was, I would like to know. Okay. So um, this one we also get run through, right? So if you then extrapolate, so apparently for for a small peptide like this, you need only a thousand different structures uh, before you find the native state, reversibly, right? So it goes through these few thousand, and then amongst these thousand is actually the native state, and apparently it visits all of them, but the native state more often than any of the others. That's why it's the native state. Yeah, that's that's why you can you can actually uh, relate all this back. Where's the final one? You can re relate all this back to just uh, oh sorry the, the definition of z is not here, but you can relate all this back to probabilities. Yeah. <coughs> um, if you extrapolate 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 this to a small protein, then you would need about sample about a billion different conformations. Like microstates. Yeah. I mean, definition of microstate in, term, in statistical thermodynamics is a tricky one, but uh, these clusters of conformations is a, is a, is a very good proxy for, for doing it. So, about a billion microstates, and one of those microstates is the native state, uh, and uh, it, you would expect that to be the most uh, likely, uh, the most likely one in, in native conditions. Okay, <clears throat> so this is our way out of Leventhal's paradox, right? So it's not a random search. You don't have to go through all the bazillion different possible confirmations. Uh, you only have to go through uh, a, a subset that is apparently realistically accessible or relevant, if you will. Okay. Um, now let's. Let's drill uh, down a little bit more into this peptide box. <coughs> so we're uh, we're looking here at uh, a confirmation, a real confirmational landscape of the same peptide simulations. So this was done uh, uh, on the same simulations that I showed you before by people in the group where I did my PhD, <coughs> and uh, uh, one or two years after the, the previous paper. And um, I'll, there'll be a later lecture later where I explain how you do principal component analysis on MD trajectories. Uh, for now, just believe me that you can do that. And you could think of this as sort of a two-dimensional root mean square deviation. Okay, so uh, that means that different that that points that are different places are uh, uh, are different in conformation. Um, because it's a projection from a high dimensional space, the reverse is not always true. So you can have two conformations that land in the same spot in this projection, but they could still be different. Yeah? So some of the differences are hidden in this projection. 
But that's it's inevitable if you because you start from thousands well in, in, for a small pipeline hundreds of different hundreds of uh, coordinates and you you bring it down to two. So, so you will be hiring some difference. But spots that are different in this on different locations are always different in structure. <coughs> and um, and it's proportional to the distance. So that, in that sense, it's very similar to RMSD. Now, the cool thing, and, and then the the uh, and and you see that this, the individual dots are there are the projections of different uh, individual conformations of the peptide uh, into this two-dimensional landscape, and they are colored by their oh I have to. I think they're colored by their enthalpic energy, but I'm not sure. They could be colored by their free energy. I have to look it up. Um, <coughs> and uh, you can see that there's a, a sparse scattering uh, here, uh, let's say on the, on the top right. Uh, and but it's very clear that there's three very distinct clusters in this in this uh, space. So these are sort of your uh, your your met like uh, metastable states, right? The different states, and one of them is going to be the most stable one under these conditions. <coughs> uh, there should be something appearing. Yeah, so uh, then if you actually you can look at the conformations uh, of, of each of these three different uh, clusters, and they look like this. So uh, it's a bit hard to see actually what conformations they are. So the, the coloring here is, is along the chain, so it goes from, from blue to red. Uh, so this is this is the uh, this is like the helical conformation. Uh, this is more of a extended conformation, and this is something more like a hairpin. So this one goes up, hairpin, and then down. This is more or less extended, and this winds around. It's a bit hard to see. They, they could have maybe only drawn the background or something. Um, and they are ordered by their the size of the cluster. So what does size of the cluster in this case represent? It's a cluster of individual conformations from the simulation. And the microstates. Well, the individual conformations are the microstates. The cluster. So what's the size of the cluster? What does that represent? Yeah, right? So if you have a thousand conformations and you cluster them, so you have, you have these two big clusters. So there are different types of clusters than the ones that I, the thousand that I mentioned before, because they're clustered more strictly. They're small, my, my way smaller clusters in terms of RMSD. These are, these are wider. These are more like basins. <coughs> um, so so uh, the, the number of points in each of these clusters is just the fraction of structures out of your whatever thousand or a million that you have from your simulation. And that's just the, the odds, the probability of being in that state during the whole simulation. Yeah? Makes sense? If it doesn't, please yell out. Yeah? Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> so this is, in fact, the most likely confirmation state. This is, and this is the helical one, because this is number one. Two is a bit smaller. You can also sort of see it from the density of the red dots here. Right? This is a bigger blob. This is a slightly smaller blob. Maybe uh, it's not smaller, but it has more gaps in it. And this is smaller. Right? <coughs> and then, in addition to these three clear clusters, there's, there's a smearing of other conformations around. Yeah? Uh, remember the RMSD plot? Yeah? So a lot of these high... high Peaks in the RMSD, some of them will be from the other clusters, but many of them will also be from this sort of unclustered smear of different All right. Okay. <coughs> now we can do more cool stuff here, because we can actually do the same kind of analysis that we did previously with the uh, the uh, lattice model. So how is that work? Ah, there we are. Yes. Uh, so you can actually uh, look at the the transitions between each of these states. Yeah. Because you can, from the simulation, you can uh, you can count every time you go from one cluster one to cluster two, from cluster one to cluster four, 
from one to three, and f uh, so one, two, and three are these clusters, and four is then everything else. That's this background smear. Um, and uh, you see that there are different. So there's zero probability to go directly from one to three. Uh, the, the zero point zero. That doesn't mean it never happened, but it happened. Might have happened maybe one or two times, right? Uh, less than. Uh, five percent or so, I would, say, I would estimate. Uh, so you see different, and the, the, the thickness of the arrows actually also represents the, uh, the probability of these transitions. So now you can, so in addition to having the different areas in your landscape, you can now also start plotting out the different transition routes between them. Yeah. <coughs> and, and this tells you something about falling rates and so on. Yeah, so maybe not so very interesting for a floppy tap light like this. Uh, but the, the principle also applies to proteins, except that we still can't really do uh, long enough simulations for proteins of interesting size to, to get enough statistics to do this kind of analysis uh, properly. Because you really want to, to, to be able to make, so to make, to make a good estimate of the relative probabilities of these states, you need to see a lot of transitions. But to make a good estimate of each of these transition probabilities, you need to see each of the transitions at least uh, so many times. Otherwise, you're still in your, your counting noise. <coughs> uh, so that's really, that makes, that makes that you really need much, much more simulations than you might uh, otherwise expect. OK. <coughs> um, in the meantime, I've actually also, without explaining to you, uh, uh, I'm going to go back. Yes, I've changed the plot here because it was, it was a two-dimensional plot. Now, we've kept the first axis, but instead of the second axis being the, uh, the second uh, conformational axis, now it's the free energy. <coughs> and then you can you know, actually see that the, the dots are colored corresponding to the free energy, not to their the interaction energy. Uh, and you see low, low free energy states, obviously, at the bottom, and then the high free energy states at the top. And you can clearly see that there are these three uh, valleys, like uh, low areas in the, in the free energy landscape, with barriers in between. Yeah. So and this also explains why there are distinct states and there are transitions that you can actually count. So to go from here to there, you'll have to go at least a little bit up in your free energy to go there. To go from here to there, you will certainly have to go way up. Right? So that means that's why transitions from from two from one to three and from two to three are much less likely than transitions from one to two. Right? Eleven, twenty-six. I'm pretty sure it must be percent. Eleven percent, twenty-six percent, and then from one to three, or from two to three. Uh, only a few percent, right? That, that's the same thing. It's just here you're looking at the structure of the landscape, and here you're looking at the actual events. Yeah? <coughs> going from here to Amstelveen, or going from here to Science Park, it's a, depending where you go in Amstelveen, but you can travel about the same distance, mm -hmm. but Science Park is slightly harder, because you have to cross the Amstel, and you can only do that from a few places. Yeah? Uh, Maybe not the best of examples, but you get the idea. <laughs> you get the idea. Uh, going to, uh, to, to north is even harder because you have to cross the, the A, which is bigger than the Amstel. Fewer places to cross. <clears throat> Although molecules don't have traffic jams because there can be as many molecules as you like on a given transition path. They don't interfere with each other in that way. Cars do, and bikes, and, uh, as I know you are uh, aware. OK, so now the other thing that we can do here is look at how this free energy landscape changes is when you change the temperature. And that's the coolest thing about this paper, uh, that you can, actually, you can actually look at the free energy diagram at different temperatures. Uh, so the, uh, this is the simulation at 340, and it's shown in red here. And then in blue, uh, they, they show the simulation at the lower temperature. Remember how it looked when you look at the RMSD. It's this, it's this one, right? 
always forward except for a few times where it, where it jumps out. <coughs> now here, you can see why. Right? It samples only these two states, and they're very close together, right? and, uh, and then it, it will jump back. And, and very, very seldomly you find something over here, which is probably sort of on the path to state three, but for, for some reason it doesn't really reach there. But you can probably, possibly, so this state is apparently sort of stable at, uh, at 340 Kelvins, but maybe it's just not stable anymore at, uh, at, at uh, two, uh, 298, that's all temperatures. So you, you do sample structures that are similar to it because they're in the same uh, axis on the, on the same spot on the conformational space axis, but you can't go down in free energy from there and, and find a stable state. Yeah, apparently, or maybe simulations were too short. That's always something that you have to keep in mind. Okay. <coughs> so this is what it looks like if you're contemplating uh, formulas like this, right? Where the probability just relates to the energy and the temperature. Yeah. In, in reality, this is what it looks like. For a peptide, yes? For proteins, it must look a bit similar, but we don't have the actual. Because I haven't found a paper yet that has the actual data. Okay. <coughs> so, then we've covered this as well, right? So, the, the where the... Uh, so, but just to make sure that that you, you get it, you all get it. So how does this slide tell you that free energy depends, that the free energy changes, so I have to be precise here. The free energy of the fallen state changes with temperature. How can you read that from this slide? Yeah? The peaks. The peaks. Okay, at the top part, you mean here? Yeah, <coughs> So the, at the higher temperature, you see more high peaks in the RMSD, yeah, and at lower temperature, you see fewer peaks in the high RMSD. Okay, how does that translate to the right panel? How does that translate to the right-hand panel on the slide? It shows you that in the, when the temperature is higher, the protein is more in well, this is low temperature. Oh yeah, sorry. I don't and this is yeah. So the 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 amount of high peaks in the RMSD is the fraction unfolded, right? Yeah. So when that goes up, your fraction folded goes down. So at high temperature, 360, you have a lower fraction folded, and at uh, low temperature, you have a higher fraction folded. So now, that's half of the answer. The other half of the answer. How does this relate to free energy? Sorry? Yes, this is the effect of entropy, but how, how can we relate this back to free energy then? Because the coefficient of temperature. Oh, yeah, so, so you mean the, um, well, uh, for sure also in these formulas, but uh, the other one here is that your, uh, your free energy is your enthalpic energy minus uh, temperature times the entropy, right? Yeah. But just from this, um, just from this slide, how can we go from the from the slide to the free energy? If the uh, most likely state to be is the one with the lowest free energy, then you see that the uh, probability to find a folded one decreases. So also something else must get a lower free energy instead of the folded one because the probability. So okay, but you say if, so you say if the, uh, how do you say it, the probability relates, uh, I don't remember how you said it, do you remember how you said it? <laughs> <laughs> but it's not an if, right? So the probability of a state is directly related to the free energy. That's what, uh, that's what Yami showed you this morning, this morning, yeah, uh, earlier, before the break, right? Um, so the the final uh, so the free energy is kvt times mz, where z is uh, this sum. No, not this sum. This sum, right? 
directly related to the probabilities. <coughs> so, um, so you can see it from here, right? You can see it from here. Okay. Uh, time. We have oh, okay. yeah, 15 minutes. So now we go to the uh, to a protein example, and I showed you this one before very briefly. Something. There's no voice. Uh, <laughs> um, so you see, uh, this is I showed you this one before, right? So now this is basically the similar, uh, similar thing, what we they did previously for the, uh, for like, um, around 2000 for the peptide. They did about 10 years later for a small protein. It's about 30 or 25 residues long, so it's, it's not really a protein, but it's, for biophysicists, it's a protein because it, it has like five residues, hydrophobic residues <coughs> on the inside. The biologists would say, ah, yeah, it's not a protein. Okay, come on, we, uh, the, the simulations are expensive. This is what we can do. <laughs> so we'll call it at least a protein because it has a hydrophobic core, or there's something hydrophobic on the inside there. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it falls. Right? And it does fall. And it does that actually re reproducibly in the simulation. So that's really the, uh, the, the key um, uh, the story of this paper, that we can show that, the, that we can actually do this falling in the simulation. And not just once, but it's, re it's repeatable, it's reversible, right? So that, me that means <coughs> you can unfold a little bit, you can fall back, you can unfold a lot, and you can fall back. This is really... A astonishing uh, feat for uh, for uh, the model to be able to do that right and the, uh, the one of the reasons for that is is actually on the board so the all the in interaction energies added up there that's a lot of energy right then the entropic part which is just all your different conformations is also represents quite a lot of energy to get the right free energy, it means the right probability of different states. These two things have to balance. Yes? And that, that's not easy, I can tell you. That's why, that's why program. people have been working on this for half a century, and then we're only starting to get it almost right. It doesn't work for all proteins. It doesn't work for all peptides. There's lots of peptides where it doesn't work, and we don't know exactly how to fix it. <coughs> uh, but people are working on fixing it. Okay. Uh, We'll, I will come back to this in the MD, uh, in the MD uh, lecture because there's a similar issue with the energies. Okay, um, so now we can actually add this um, this peptide, sorry, this small protein, to the example that I had previously, where we have the small peptide which has to sample about a thousand different states, uh, and a, a small protein like a hundred, like a small real protein. Uh, which would have to sample about a billion states, then this one is, is with 30 residues somewhere in between. Logarithmically, it's almost exactly in the middle. Um, <coughs> experimentally, it's known to fall in about, it's 10 to the minus 5, that's about 0.1, no, that's about 10 microseconds, which is actually very fast for protein, even the small one. So, extrapolating that, it would need to have, you would need to observe about a billion, oh, sorry, a million structures, right? Now, unfortunately, what they didn't do in the paper is cluster the unfolded state conformations, uh, because it would be very interesting to see if they actually get about a million different clusters. But if you look at them and you consider that the different unfolded state must be different, but if you unfold once and then you have different, you, have, you sample unfold conformations, they are going to be relatively similar, these ones. Then if you fold again and you unfold uh, later on, then you might have very, very different unfolded conformations. So to say is that uh, it's very unlikely that you get like thousands of different, really different unfold conformations from one unfolding event. And there's only like a handful of unfolding events here, maybe 10. 
Yeah, so you maybe you sample a thousand unfolded confirmations here, maybe ten thousand. Probably not. Probably not even a thousand. Maybe a few hundred over here, maybe again a thousand over there. If you add it up, maybe you have ten thousand different confirmations, but not nearly a million. Yes? So you would have to simulate a hundred, maybe a thousand times longer, maybe a million times longer even than, uh, than this to actually really get a good uh, complete sampling of all the unfolded states. And only if you get that, then you, then you start to, to know that the different probabilities of the states that you're observing in your simulation, plus all the probabilities of the transitions between all those states, uh, are starting to um, to be sampled enough that you can have a reliable estimate of all these probabilities. That's what we call convergence. We'll come back to that again in the MD lecture. <coughs> but that's that means convergence here means that the equilibrium, or no, I should rephrase that. It's that the ensemble of states that you observe in your simulation is indistinguishable from the equilibrium ensemble that you can observe in your experiment. Yeah? That mean, that's what convergence means. It means that you're actually simulating the state that you're interested in. And, and it's called convergence because it's very slow. So you slowly converge to that equilibrium state. You're getting closer and closer and closer all the time. But all the time, you're, you don't know how far you still have to go. I'll have an explicit slide on that. You might have seen it in the, in the book already if you've browsed through the chapter, which one is 14, I think. Um, oh, there was a question, by the way, on the, on the why, where are chapters 8 and 10? Uh, we, we used to have them um, because we first, the first structure of the book was just mapping all the lectures. Each lecture was a chapter. And then with the structure uh, prediction uh, chapters, we found we, we later on decided to, to re restructure that. So we just ditched two chapters. But because everybody was already working on this book for uh, for a while, uh, we didn't want to get confused in all our notes. Like, oh, check this with chapter 10, and then suddenly chapter 10 has become chapter 8. Or, or, and so we didn't want to get into that confusion. That's why we're keeping the old number in, which has two gaps. Um, <coughs> um, Yes, but I, I will get to back to convergence uh, in the MD uh, lecture uh, later on. Okay, so um, so this this simulation in the statistical thermodynamic sense is not converged. Right, it's showing the right type of behavior. Uh, it looks realistic, but it's not long enough to be able to trust all the probabilities that you can can drive. From. Nevertheless, you can do a very interesting. Uh, observations from it. For example, uh, what they do in one of the figures in the paper, they actually look at one of the folding transitions and the unfolding transitions where they, uh, instead of looking at the, at the RMSD of the whole thing, they separate it out into uh, different parts of the, uh, of the it's, a, it's a double beta hairpin uh, structure actually, so it's like a three-stranded beta sheet. Um, I'm not so good with these colors, but I'm pretty sure the middle part, the, like the beta sheet, is orange, and then the one loop is blue, the other loop is green, and then the, the termini are red, I think. I made, uh, do they have different colors? No? Same red. Okay. And, and they, these colors correspond to the traces in the fault. So you can see that uh, the first loop falls first then a bit of the second loop, then the hairpin forms, the, the, the three standard sheet forms, and then only the, the, the both termini fall into place. Yeah. Uh, so there's a very clear order of events in this. Uh, and they, 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 don't, they say in the paper that the other unfolding events also follow this uh, same trend. But they don't show the, uh, the figures for that. Maybe in the supplement material. I don't think so. And um, also interestingly, if you look at an unfolding event, you see the reverse. So it's the termini that could go first, and then uh, one of the strands, then the one loop, then the rest of the strand, and then only at the end does the uh, confirmation of the, the blue loop start to change. So that's an interesting one. 
So that, that basically means that the um, that this is the, the the left part is the core of the uh, of the protein, and the, the other one is more more less tightly bound to the uh, to the rest. Right. So the, the the binding of the third strand to the rest is is weaker than the binding of the first strand, <coughs> because otherwise it wouldn't unfold first, or it wouldn't fall last. Right? So similar. <coughs> the other thing that they looked at uh, is uh, when you're at the folding, or in the middle of the folding transition, so there's like a transition state, uh, what kind of conformations do you have there? So this is the, the transition state ensemble. So these are all the conformations from all the folding and unfolding transitions that are almost exactly midway. And you have to look very carefully in the paper to be able to understand how they've defined midway, because that's not trivial. It's also way too much detail for you to you guys to know, you don't need to know all that, all that detailed um, uh, parts of the, of the paper, but it, if you're interested, then you, that's why you should. <coughs> and then, uh, this, this looks like one hairpin, right? It's, it's very, it's a fuzzy thing, but you, you can see there's one hairpin, and maybe a little bit of like half a second one, right? So that's sort of the transition state ensemble. So there's, there's most of one hairpin already formed, performing, and maybe the other one is sort of trying to get there. That's, that's the transition part. If you're unfolding, it's, it's trying to stay there, but it's starting to unravel. It's, it, it's, it's always symmetric. And then what they did there is to actually look at um, the forward and so the unfolding folding transitions and the unfolding transitions, and to see whether there is a difference in probability when you're at one of those conformations uh, at the transition state, in, um, uh, how to say this? It's about commitment, actually. So if you're, in, if, you're, if you're looking at the transition state during a folding transition, are you actually going to move to the folded transition all the time, or can you move back? And this shows that you, so this shows that there's from the transition state, which is halfway, which is like a half, 50%, you have 50% chance of going forward or backward from that, from that, uh, from that position. Okay, does it make sense? So it, to, to, in, a, in a different, in a, I'll, I'll try to rephrase it in a different way. Uh, the question here is, <coughs> Basically, is the is the falling ballistic like throwing a ball to the other side? If I throw a ball or whatever, and once it's moving, it will will keep moving till it's in the other state. Right? That's sort of one uh, possible model for your folding and falling transition. Once it starts falling, it will keep falling till it's folded. Right? That that then it's ballistic or uh, kinetic, if you will. <coughs> the other one, I always. So it's like skiing. Yeah. Once you go down the slope, you'll you'll come you you usually unless you get an accident the hard way, you'll usually end up at the bottom. Yeah. Um, the the other uh, possibility is more like a a group of small kids who have their first skiing lessons. Right. They'll go every every. They're more diffusive. They'll go every way. They'll end up at the bottom eventually, but not in a straight line. They might wander off and go back uphill. Uh, yeah. Eventually they'll end up, but from any given point, they might go up or down. Yeah. You never know. Okay? So that's that's a diffusive model. So And if you have this diffusive model, then from any given point, you're equally likely to go forward or backwards. Yeah? That's like, think of, I don't know, uh, kindergarten, a group of kindergarten age kids, right? So, yeah, it's very hard. Or a group of scientists in, in on a on a conference visiting the city center looking for a place to have food. They behave almost exactly like two-year-old kids. They'll go. It's been described as herding cats uh, once to me. Okay, so th that means that from any given point, you're equally likely to go forward or backwards. And, and believe me, if you're starting to get hungry after a day of conference, 
which is a very frustrating experience. Because you want to go to, to, and then everybody else wants to go, no, and then everybody else wants to go there again. And it takes efforts for, before you get anything to eat. So that's what happens here, right? So uh, from, from the mid state, when you're on a falling transition, which is the uh, black uh, line, you're equally likely to go actually move on towards folded or to move back towards unfolded. And, uh, and, and the red one is when you are in a, in a transition that's eventually going to be unfolding, you have the same half probability halfway to go back or to forward. Yeah? Okay. <clears throat> um, so that means that this is, this is like um, three-year-olds or like scientists trying to find, uh, with a group of scientists trying to find for dinner. Uh, and it's not connected. Um, right. Um, also, here you can actually make a free energy diagram. So you have that. And then it's the, the free energy axis is horizontal. Uh, the, but that's, that's because then you can actually relate. Please go on. You can actually relate. I want it to be. Oh, it doesn't do it. But it's not all this thing. Oh. <coughs> You can actually relate the only z-axis here to the reaction coordinate axis there, right? And then this is low free energy, so this is what? If this is low free energy, this is what? What state is this? Native, forward. It's definitely the most stable state in these conditions, but it's because it has a low RMSD, it's also probably the native forward state. Yeah? Okay, and then they have another state here. Uh, which is higher RMSD, uh, higher free energy, so less. It's even less likely. Don't, don't worry about this dip here. Let's see the dip. But what is this peak here? The least likely confirmation in the whole in the whole setup. Right? It is this peak. What what is this peak here? Transition. This is a transition state, right? Because you're not staying there. You you you're going. Eventually, I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll diffuse back and forth a bit there, but eventually you'll drop off either to this direction or to that direction. Yeah? So I'm going to come back to this. Did, she, did someone discuss with you detailed balance already? No. That will, hmm? that will come back in, in one of the later lectures with Monte Carlo. This has to do with detailed balance. It means the forward reaction is equally likely as the backward reaction. And that means you're in equilibrium. Actually. Okay. Uh, so here also you can see that probability relates to free energy, and you can write it forwards or backwards. Uh, that's with, and, and here the, the um, zeta c is uh, is the reaction coordinate. You think of it is well, it's, it's a derivative of RMSD, but it's slightly more fancy because uh, of reasons. Okay, they also tried this for another protein. I just want to finish with that. Uh, and then they did do clustering. Yay! Um, so now we have RMSD versus uh, native. Uh, this is their simulation time. This is milliseconds. This is impressive. These guys are, I'm really, really uh, envious of them. Uh, that is the same, it's the same paper. Uh, this is BPTI, bovine pancreatic uh, tryptin inhibitor. Yeah. <coughs> Two minutes. Um, so each of the colors corresponds to a cluster. So which one is the most stable state? I'm not doing the colors. Is, it, is this what you mean with orange? To me, it looks red. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So how can you say how can you say that this is the most stable state? Most of the time. I'm sorry. It's in that state. Most of the time. Is that a very accurate? estimate of the probability of this state? How many transitions into and out of this state do you have seen? Maybe 10, 5, something like that? I'd like to see 100 before I can believe that this is, because if you come back to that state 100 times and, and you're still there most of the time, then you know it's stable. Right? If somebody goes to FABO once, that doesn't mean they like it. <laughs> yeah? Could it be out of necessity? <laughs> Whatever causes that. But if you go there 
two times a week, then either you have a very strange idea of necessity, or you actually like it. Yes? Okay. Um, simple examples. Okay, so now the, the final thing here is, this most stable state is this here, the neighbor state. So this one is the most stable state. Is this the native state? How do we recognize native state in this form? Well, certainly a low arm yeah, is okay. yeah. uh, Zero is the crystal structure, and we're doing simulation, so you, you might not be able to get exactly at zero. <coughs> also, the, 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 the crystal structure resolution will be about one, 1. 1.5 angstroms. Right, so that, uh, you have the deviation already. But uh, this one is lower, so this one is definitely closer to the native state than the, uh, the orange one. Yeah? But it's not the most stable state in the simulation. Why is that? There's a couple of answers, possible answers to that. It could be, it could be yeah, or other, other changes in conditions. It could be diff the different pH or salt concentration. That that makes uh, this 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 state more stable than the simulation. Yes, it could be that the simulation is too short. That this one isn't actually the most stable, but it just happens to be there a bit often, a bit more often. Uh, if we simulate like 100 times longer, this is an extremely long simulation for simulations, right? So, but if you could simulate this 100 times longer, then we might get different probabilities. What's the third option? The Yeah, or in a, yeah. So, so whether if you get this balance wrong, or in other words, your model isn't good. Yeah, this, so the parameters of the interactions in your simulation aren't uh, aren't good. Yeah. Okay. With that, uh, I'll leave you, uh, or at least we'll stop today. Uh, if there are any questions about the lecture, I'll have time. I'll be around during the practicals, um, and I'll not see you guys next week because I'll be on holiday. So I'm going to do the and I'll be back the week after.